Hello, we're going to look today at solving linear equations with one variable and linear inequalities in one variable. Uh, first, linear equations though will be our focus. You should have a background in solving linear equations in one variable, but just a quick review of some steps of how to solve one. Uh, you're dealing with an equation with only one letter to solve for one variable, and that variable will only have an exponent of one on it. So you only have like an x to the first to solve for. You won't have an x squared because then you're likely dealing with a quadratic equation. You don't have an x cubed. That's cubic. Uh, you, just, you just have x. And we're going to solve these in the same steps that you've always solved these. First, eliminate fractions and decimals if they are there. Or that's totally up to you. It's an optional step. You could just work with the fractions and decimals. You don't have to eliminate them. Then you know, take each side of the equation and simplify as much as you can. Simplify the left side, simplify the right side. Use your addition property of equality to get stuff moved to different sides. You, you want to get your x or variable terms on one side and your non-variable terms on the other side. Then finish getting the variable by itself using the multiplication property of equality. And then finally, you know, check your solution and make sure it works using the original equation. So I'm going to do a couple of examples that go through these steps and show you, you know, to review how to solve these. Okay, so the first one I'm going to do uh, doesn't have any fractions or decimals in it, but it does have quite a few parentheses and some other things that we have to work with. Okay, so the first equation we're going to do starts out with a negative bracket x minus parentheses 4x plus 2 close parentheses close brackets equals 2 plus parentheses 2x plus 7 close parentheses okay so this is the linear equation in one variable and our variable is x that we're solving for there are no fractions or decimals to worry about here, but what I do need to do is simplify each side of the equation. Simplify the left side, simplify the right side. Okay, so I'm going to look at the left side first. On the left side, I do have brackets and parentheses. So parentheses are on the innermost grouping symbol, so i got to work with them first. So I need in there to distribute this minus sign that's in front of those parentheses. And that, by distributing the minus sign, I'll then be rid of the parentheses in there. Still have the brackets because I haven't finished simplifying everything yet. Um, in the brackets, I can combine like terms, x minus 4x, and get negative 3x. And then minus 2 is not a like term, so it just stays there as minus 2. And finally, since now inside the brackets is as simplified as it gets, I can distribute that minus sign that's outside the brackets, and I get 3x plus 2. Okay, that's all I can do on the left side for now. So I'll go over to the right side. Right side has just parentheses, no brackets. In the parentheses, I have 2x plus 7. That's not going to simplify. In front of the parentheses, I have a plus sign, which when you distribute, it's not really going to change things, so it's going to be plus 2x plus 7 without the parentheses because it's like you're distributing a plus one, a plus one there <clears throat> and then like terms well 2x doesn't have any x terms to combine with but the plus 2 and the plus 7 will combine and give you plus 9 okay so that's the step of simplifying left side simplifying right side well, next, we want to get the x's on one side and the non-x's on the other side. You know, so uh, we have a 3x on the left, a 2x on the right. Since it's a positive 2x, let's do the opposite and subtract 2x. But what you do on one side, you also got to do on the other. Because of this equal sign, you've got to keep things balanced. You've got to treat both sides the same. you got to treat both sides equally. So if you're going to subtract 2x here, you've got to subtract 2x there. And then I'm trying to get x by itself, so this plus 2 needs to go. 
So I'll do the opposite and subtract 2, because 2 minus 2 is 0. But what I do on the left, I also got to do on the right. So I get x equals 7. And this one didn't give me the opportunity to use the multiplication property of equality. But if I had gotten to this step, and if there had been something either in front of x or under x, then I would use the multiplication property of equality. Like if there was a number in front of x, I would divide both sides by it. If x was divided, if there was a number under x, I'd multiply both sides by it. And finish getting x by itself. But I don't have to do that because x is by itself. And that was a really terrible drawing of set braces. But anyways, um, so solution set has 7 in it. 7 is the solution set. And you can always check by taking the original equation and substituting x for set with 7. I was going through everywhere I see x instead of putting times 7. And then following my order of operations and working out both sides, I want to make sure that the two sides come out exactly the same. So let's see here. 4 times 7, I have to do inside the parentheses, 4 times 7 is 28, plus 2 is 30. 7 minus 30 is negative 23, and then negative, negative becomes positive. And on that side, 2 times 7 is 14. 14 plus 7 should give you 21, and 2 plus 21 is 23. So they both come out the same. 23 is not your solution, it's just what you get when you plug in 7 and simplify. Seven's the solution. Seven's that magic number that you plugged in for x that worked. Okay, so that's that's a linear equation in one variable. How about we do one with some fractions next? Because although this step is totally optional, I do want to show you how to handle eliminating fractions if you decide to choose to do so. Um, so let's take this equation. We got 3 fourths plus 1 fifth x minus 1 half equals 4 fifths x. Now you can go ahead and solve this using the fractions. It's perfectly okay. But I'm going to go ahead and get rid of the fractions. So I'm going to look at all the fractions that are in the equation. I'm going to determine what the least common denominator of those fractions would be. Let's see, I got a 4, a 5, a 2, and a 5. So if you start thinking about your multiples, you know, your multiples of 4, 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, 24, 28, etc. Think about multiples of 5, 5, 10, 15, 20, ooh, 20 is in common. Let's see, then 2, you have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. <clears throat> Let's see, so you've got, you've got a 10 in common between these two, but not there. So the first one that all three of them have in common is 20. So 20 is the L going to be the LCD, the least common denominator. So if we take the equation, um, you know, an equation with an equal sign, you're allowed to add or subtract anything you want as long as you do it from both sides. You're also allowed to multiply or divide anything except any real number except zero, as long as you do it to both sides. But we're going to use that to our advantage here to help us to simplify things. We're going to multiply both sides of the equation by this 20 that we just found, this LCD. And in doing so, as we simplify, we're going to find that our fractions go away. So we're going to take the left side, the 3 fourths plus 1 fifth x minus 1 half, and we'll multiply that by 20. And then we're also going to take the right side, 4 fifths x, and multiply that by 20. 
Okay, so left side, distribute the 20 to every term. Um, so I've got 20 times 3 fourths plus 20 times 1 fifth x minus 20 times 1 half equals 20 times 4 fifths x. Uh, do some reducing. You get 5 times 3 or 15 plus 4x minus 10 equals 16x. So you got 4x plus 5 equals 16x. Okay, so I'm going to go and subtract 4x from both sides. I just like avoiding negatives if I can. You don't have to. But. So you get 5 equals 12x. And now I get to use my multiplication property of equality. You know, I'm trying to take x and get it by itself. And I honestly I feel better with x on the left. So since it's an equal sign, you can just you know, flip it like that. You can put 12x for on the left and 5 on the right. Uh, but I want to get this x by itself. And right now with that 12 next to it, that means multiply. You know, 12 times x. So I'm going to think opposite and divide by 12, but make sure I do the same thing on both sides. So divide by 12, I get x, 1x or x equals 5 twelfths. So 5 twelfths, I am so terrible at drawing these set braces. So five, the set solution set contains 5 twelfths. 5 twelfths is the answer. If you wanted to check it, you know, you plug it back into the original equation. You've got 3 fourths. You always plug back into the original equation to check. Plus 1 fifth times 5 twelfths minus 1 half equals 4 fifths times 5 twelfths. Let's see. So 3 fourths plus. Let's see, that'll reduce and give me 1 twelfth minus 1 half equals, that'll reduce, that'll reduce. So it's going to equal 1 third. Let's see, I'm going to convert that to 9 twelfths, plus we got the 1 twelfth, convert that to 6 twelfths. So we got 4 twelfths equals 1 third, 1 third equals 1 third. It works! Yay! Ooh, correct answer. Awesome. Okay, so so there's two examples. If you want to take a de problem with decimals and get rid of the decimals, all you got to do is see how many what, what look at each term and see which one has the most decimal places. Whichever one does have the most decimal places, you're going to use a power of ten with that many zeros. So if you if you have like three decimal places, then use one thousand or Two decimal places use 100 and multiply both sides by that, you know, 10, 100, 1000, whatever number you end up using. And, and that'll eliminate your decimals for you if you want to. Or you can just solve it with the decimals and get the same thing. So. Okay, so the two methods I just showed you are analytical. You know, you're working them out, you're doing step by step, scratching pencil to paper. Uh, I'm going to next, I'm going to take that last equation we did that had the brackets and parentheses and I'm going to next show you how to punch it into your calculator and use graphing methods to help you to figure out what your solution should be and as I go I'll try to show you a little bit about how to use your calculator too okay so next slide talks a little bit about the two methods we've got the intersection of graphs method and the x-intercept method and they they're basically what they sound like the intersection of graphs method, you're going to end up with two graphs and you're going to see where they intersect. And that intersection will tell you the solution to your equation. The x-intercept method, you're going to end up looking at an x-intercept for a particular graph and that will tell you the solution to the equation. So what I'm going to do is end the show and then I'm going to pull up my graphing calculator here.
<clears throat> Let's see. Actually, let me minimize that. That's just, that's just too big. <clears throat> Put my graphing calculator here. And I'm going to go back to that equation, that, fir that first equation that we saw, which is in this slide over here. And I'm going to show you how to put it into the calculator and find the same solution. We had figured out that x equals 7 in that equation. Well, we're going to figure that out again just by graphing. So on your TI-83 or TI-84 calculator, if you want to go into graphing, well, first, you know, there's a couple things that's good to check. Just, just in case somebody used your calculator before you and messed with something, go to mode. And make sure you're on normal, float. That doesn't really matter, but function, real, all, all of those, just make sure all of that's selected. You know, you go to, you can scroll up or down and then select, put put it over the one you want and then hit enter and that'll select it. Just, just to save you some grief later in case somebody messed with those sort of settings. Uh, like if you're taking a trig class, you're going to come down here and mess with parametric, polar, etc. Uh, but right now in college algebra, you don't need all that. Okay, so so then go to y equals, and this is where you're going to type in your equations for the um, graphing. Well, we're going to first do the intersection of graphs method. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is take the left side, you know, hang on, let me go ahead and do this um, and pull that up for you. Uh, we're going to take the left side of the equation this negative bracket x minus parenthesis 4x plus 2 close parenthesis close, close bracket we're going to put that in for y1 and then the 2 plus parenthesis 2x plus 7 we're going to put that in for y2 okay all right now be careful if you're wanting to put in a negative sign use this button down here down here you've got you've got your numbers and you got zero decimal point and then that's your negative sign that's different than using subtraction, which is over here. You got your addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. So, so we're going to start out with a negative sign because we have negation bracket. And then to do brackets or parentheses, you, you just use parentheses. So right here above the 8 and the 9, you see your parentheses buttons. And then when you go to put in x for a variable, like for graphing, you want to use this little button next to the alpha key has an x, a t, a theta, and an n, and that will give you the x variable. And then we got minus, so I'm actually going to use the minus sign, parentheses, 4, up here to x, plus 2, parentheses, parentheses. You know, in the problem it had parentheses and then brackets. Brackets are just another way of saying parentheses. Okay, then push your down arrow. There's arrows right here you can use. And then in the Y2 slot, notice mine's already showing me the graph for Y1. Y1's a line. Y1 equals negative parentheses X minus parentheses 4X plus 2. That is the equation of a line. And you can already see the line right here. But I'll tell you in a minute how to pull that up in your calculator. All right, Y2. And we're going to put in the right side of the equation. We have this 2 plus parentheses 2x plus 7. Let me put that in. So 2 plus parentheses 2 and then this x plus 7, close parentheses. All right, and then now to see the graph, hit this little graph button right here. And voila. If you don't like the view, you can go to zoom and pick different ways to zoom. Like you can go down to number three, zoom out, hit enter, and then hit enter again. You can zoom out. That's one way of doing it. There's all kinds of ways you can zoom. We'll, we'll encounter each of them later. Okay, but right now, all I'm interested in seeing is roughly where the intersection is, because that's what's going to be important for figuring out what my solution should be. I want the calculator to tell me where that intersection point is, and it will. If you look up here at your graphing buttons, you have the y equals, the window, the zoom, the trace, and the graph. We used y equals to type in the equations. We hit graph to see the graph. We did second trace, or calc, 
um, we're going to do that in a minute to see what that intersection is. There's other options, you know, we zoomed, or you can go in and manually set what window you want it to be on. But, but for now, we're, we're fine, I think. Okay, so we're going to do second trace, which is the calc menu up there. And we want to figure out where these two lines intersect. So that's number five. You can either scroll down to five or you can type five. And then scroll down to five, hit enter, or type five, and there you go. And it's going to ask you a series of questions. It's going to say first curve. Well, right now, if you move your left or right arrows, you can see that there's a cursor blinking on one of the lines. Um, just go ahead and say, hit say yes, so hit enter. And then the cursor should have jumped to the other line, which in this case it did. That's the second curve, so enter. And then when it asks you, do you want us to guess? You can say, okay, yes, guess, like what, that's going to find the answer. Hit enter. And then now all those little cursors disappeared, and there's only one cursor right here at the intersection, and it's telling you the coordinates of that intersection. The x coordinate is your solution to that equation. And that agrees with what we found when we did it analytically. When we solved, worked it out step by step, we got seven, x equals 7. And when we just looked at the intersection of graphs, we also got that x equals 7. So there you go. One magic way of doing it. <laughs> well, not really magic, but kind of cool. You're, you're seeing where the left side and the right side collide, where they overlap. If wherever the left side and right side overlap, that's where they're equal to each other. And that's where x is 7. So that's, that is one uh, technique. The second technique is the x-intercept method. It's a little different. So um, let's go back to y equals. And let's, let's leave y1 and y2 in there. Don't delete them. And I'm going to show you a little trick where you can do stuff with y1 and y2 without ever having to retype or delete anything. For this next method, for the x-intercept method, we need to take left side minus right side. We need to take y1 minus y2. And so what you can do in your calculator is you can use this VARS button over here. You know, under your little arrow keys, you have VARS and clear. VARS stands for variables. You can make sure your cursor right now is blinking next to Y3, then go to VARS. We want Y variables, and we're dealing with functions. We're not dealing with parametric or polar equations right now, so we're not intrigued yet. So we're going to hit enter, and there's all your a list of like your Y1, Y2, Y3. We need Y1, so we're going to hit enter, and there it is. You've just told the calculator, okay, at Y3, go back and look at Y1's equation. And then we need to subtract y2. So we go to vars again. You can't just type y2, you gotta do this vars menu. Go to y vars, number one function, then go down to y2 and hit enter. And there it is. And you can see my graphs already graphing y1 minus y2 right here. Well, I my graph's gonna be too cluttered with y1 and y2 actually in there separately. So I'm going to move my cursor over to the equal sign next to y2 and hit enter. And that'll make the calculator quit graphing y2. And then the same thing with y1. You, you put the cursor right there on the equal sign and hit enter. And then that way you're deselecting those two. So the calculator will no longer graph those two. It's only graphing y sub 3, which is the difference of the two. All right, so going back to graph. We only have one line, and in this method, we want to see where the line crosses the x-axis. We want to see where the x-intercept is. So do your second trace to go to that calc menu, and choose number five, intersect. I mean, I'm sorry, not intersect. <laughs> Excuse me. Second calc. <laughs> we don't want intersect. We want um, x-intercept. I was thinking intercept and saw intercept. Sorry about that. Uh, you want zero. Zero of the function is where it crosses the x-axis. So hit that. 
and then uh, left bound, right? You're trying to see right here where it crosses the x-axis. You're trying to see exactly what that is. And you can't just use the little cursor thing because it kind of jumps over that point. But when it says left bound, make sure your cursor is to the left of the place you're trying to identify. Hit enter. When it says right bound, move your cursor to the right of where it is you're trying to identify. Hit enter. And then hit enter again to guess. And there it is. It's telling you exactly where the line intersects that x-axis. That's 7 comma 0. So the solution is x equals 7. So there you have it. Same solution again. Two different graphing methods to get there. <clears throat> All right. One more concept with this graphing equations. Sometimes you solve an equation and you don't get a solution, or you get infinite solutions. These things can happen. You don't get a solution, you got a contradiction. You get infinite solutions, you got an identity. So I want to go through and solve two equations and show you exactly what happens in those situations. Okay. Let's do a contradiction first. All right, the equation looks like this. My pen, my trusty pen back. I like black. Maybe someday I'll change colors, but for now, just deal with classic black. Okay. We got 5 minus 4x equals... 5x minus parentheses 9 plus 9x. Alright, so on the left side, 5 minus 4x, nothing we can really do with that right now. This is two different two unlike terms, nothing to simplify. Right side though, we have this minus sign that can be distributed. So we have 5x minus 9 minus 9x. And then we have some like terms that can be combined. 5x minus 9x is negative 4x minus 9. All right, I'm going to get my x's on the same side. So if I have a negative 4x, I'm going to do the opposite and add 4x. But what I do to one side, I also got to do to the other. And I quickly see an issue. Uh-oh. I add 4x to both sides. I don't have any x's anymore because negative 4x and plus 4x come out to just 0. 0x zero or 0. So on the left side, I've got a 5. On the right side, I've got negative 9. And no x to solve for. And 5 definitely does not equal negative 9. This is a contradiction. And with that x disappearing the way it does, no matter what real number you picked and plug in for x, it will never work. You'll always end up with this inequality, this contradiction. This doesn't equal. So there is no solution to this. There is no real number that will work for x here. So you'll see this little symbol in the book. This stands for null set, empty set. In other words, the solution set is empty. There is no answer that can go in there and would ever work. No real number. So, <clears throat> so that's what that looks like. Now, if we put that in the calculator, let's clear things up and put that particular equation into the calculator. Interesting thing happens. Um, let's put the 5 minus 4x in for y1. Let's put the 5x minus parentheses 9 plus 9x in for y2. And then graph. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in. Zoom. 
Let's do number two. You can't prove it by looking at this, this graph, but let me tell you, knowing that this is a contradiction, I know that these two lines are parallel. These two lines will never intersect each other. They will never overlap. So there's no solution they have in common. So that confirms right there that we have a contradiction. You know, or knowing we have a contradiction, we know that those are going to be parallel lines. So they don't touch. There's no way to, there's no solution there, you know, overlap. Oops. Sometimes I forget, I have to go back to my, um, pen here. <clears throat> So parallel lines. You really can't check this because there's no solution to plug in. <laughs> you can try, but no fun, not fun. All right, and then let me give you an example of one that's an identity too, so that you can see both. You just saw a contradiction. Um, let's give you an identity next. Uh, 3 parentheses x plus 2 close parentheses minus 5 parentheses x plus 2 close parentheses equals negative 2x minus 4. Okay, left side I can distribute my 3 and get 3x plus 6. Distribute my minus 5 and get minus 5x minus 10. And see, 3x minus 5x is negative 2x plus 6 minus 10 is minus 4. And I'm getting very suspicious here because it looks very familiar. Oh boy, left side and right side are the same. Even if you didn't spot this and you kept trying to solve, you're going to quickly run into some interesting stuff. Uh, you can try to add 2x to both sides. And just like the contradiction example I did a few minutes ago, the x's disappear. Oh boy, no x to solve for. But you look at what's left. And negative 4 does indeed equal negative 4. This is going to always be true. So no matter what real number you plug in for x, you're always going to come out with something that works. Because x, the x part disappears anyways. It doesn't matter what you plug in for x because x goes away. And you're always going to be left with a true statement. So your solution set, uh, th this situation is called an identity. And your solution set involves all real numbers. No, it's going to bug me. This should be capital A. Because now I'm, I made it a sentence like in the middle of my writing it. Anywho, <laughs> all real numbers work. So. On a number line, you can pick any number you want from negative infinity to positive infinity, and it's going to work. So you can write an interval. You can say, well, the leftmost number that's possible is negative infinity, which infinity is not really a number, but uh, right, the furthest right you can go is positive infinity. You can't actually touch infinity, so you use parentheses around the infinities. And that's interval notation. You, know, you use brackets for stuff you touch, you use parentheses for stuff you, you don't touch. And in this case, you, you can never touch infinity. Nobody can reach it. So, But you want to display the idea that it's every possible real number. So you're saying it's everything you know, from, an, from as far as you can go left to as far as you can go right. Any of those will work. <clears throat> and let's real quickly look at the graph.
<clears throat> okay, let's go back to our calculator here. And let's clear up what was in there from earlier. And let's put this equation in. <clears throat> All right, we got three parentheses x plus two close parentheses minus five parentheses <clears throat> x plus two. That was the left side. And then on the right side, we have negative, so negative sign, 2x, and then minus subtraction sign, 4. Oh, man, I only see one line. What's going on here? Well, you didn't do anything wrong. You actually did it right. But we can't see what's going on, so let's make the calculator show us. Go down here to Y2. Scroll to the left. Right now my equal sign's blinking. Scroll to the left again, and that little line next to Y2 will be blinking. And you can start pushing Enter here and tell the calculator to draw your line different ways. Push Enter once, it's going to tell it, draw that second line thick. Push enter again, it's going to tell sh to shade, which we'll do later. Enter again, shading. Enter again, you start getting statistical plots. So, like scatter plot, dotted line, back to regular line. We want it thick. That's what we want. So, I'm going to leave it on thick and I'm going to hit graph. Watch my graph closely. Draw on the line, draw on the line. Did you see what happened there? All right, let me see if I can do it again. Okay, back to Y equals, now hit graph. Let's see if it, ah, oh, it won't do it again, dang it. But it drew the thin line, and then right on top drew the thick line. What's happening here is that the two solution, the two sides are basically the same equation. The left side and the right side, the left side boils down to the same equation as the right side. So when you graph the lines, they are the same line. So they overlap on every point on that line. Every single one of these points on this line is a common solution between the two sides. So there's infinite solutions, but they all exist only on this line. This entire line would make, it has, like all the points on this line are the solutions to that e equation. And every solution to that equation is found on this line. So, nowhere else. <clears throat> so there's, you know, infinite solutions. All real numbers will work. So that's, that's what happens with the graph. The graph ends up having, the graph ends up having, um, I gotta change my pen again, don't I? <sighs> So, so yeah, your graph, you end up with coinciding lines. So like in that case, you got one line, and then you got another line that goes right on top of it. So, same line, basically. Okay, well, there you go. That's what you need as far as solving linear equations in one variable. We've looked at some different situations. We've looked at analytical versus graphing. And there's plenty of practice for you to do with that. We next need to talk about linear inequalities. In this book, they're actually in the same section. But I didn't want to do all of that in the same video. So tune in to the next podcast for the linear inequalities portion of this. Thank you for joining us.